So, Billy, welcome to the show. Boy, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, we're happy to have you. So, first off, why don't you tell us a little bit about your company, Billy Footwear? Sure. Uh, so, Billy Footwear, as the name implies, uh, we are a shoe company. We are based out of Seattle, Washington, um, it's an area that I was born and raised and still live here. And uh, our uh, premise um, of our shoes, we have zippers in our shoes. And having zippers in shoes isn't necessarily original, but the way we do it, it is original in that the zipper goes on the outside of the shoe and around the toe, which actually allows the whole shoe to open up. So instead of like shoving your foot into a shoe, you're literally like stepping in, like your foot mm -hmm. like places in to the unobstructed footbed. So that's how we differentiate out in the market. And uh, it's been a fun ride. No, it, it, it's amazing. When I was initially looking into the shoe, I had a hard time wrapping my head around what I was reading in, in the description of it. And then when I saw a video of it, I thought it was pretty fascinating because it, it is what you described. But most times or most of the time when someone explains like zippers on a shoe, they imagine it, it just is kind of like zipping up the dead middle of it. But you can't even really tell that there's a zipper on these shoes. Um, which is really quite fascinating. So how did you come up with this idea? Yeah, well, first to touch on what you just said, I mean, the, the zipper really follows the contour of the shoe. So you're right, it, does, it doesn't necessarily scream having that zipper on there. Exactly. And uh, it, it's when it opens up, and you're like, oh my gosh, it opens up like a book and you can step in and see the insult. People are like, what? That is totally different. So to your question though, uh, so why this, why, why this configuration, why is it important? Um, when I was 18 years old, I fell out of a three-story window and I broke my neck. And when that happened, uh, it was a spinal cord injury, which left me paralyzed from the chest down. So there's so many things I used to be able to do that I could no longer do. And on that long list, putting on my shoes was one of those deals. Hmm. So I didn't really see anything out on the market that was satisfying, satisfying or like a widget out there that I could put on one independently but to something that still had the same fashion appeal to something that I wore prior to being in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. So because of that, uh, I teamed with a buddy and we did something about it. So I started with one pair of shoes for myself. And uh, just this past summer, we've sold our millionth pair. So that is we really, an we, amazing we, we, milestone. We got the, yeah, dude, we got, the ta we got the tiger by the tail and uh, we're doing everything we can to hold on. No, that is fascinating. And 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 I think you bring up something that, that that's interesting is like usually when there is some other problem that needs to be solved in terms of like accessibility or usability for, you know, your situation, there is like a stylistic um, compromise almost in terms of like the way it looks or the way it feels might not be as nice as someone else because you're trying to solve a different problem. But with your shoes, you actually were able to do both where it still looks good and has this um, added accessibility to it. Um, I, I want to kind of talk about universal design a little bit. So can you kind of explain that concept of what universal design is? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, well, we really want to take fashion and function and smash it together. And mm -hmm. uh, so we want to create a widget that works for everybody. And that's where that term kind of universal design comes in. Prior to this whole shoe space, um, I graduated college as a mechanical engineer. I was working as a mechanical engineer for the Federal Aviation Administration, which is a wow. completely different line of business than what this is. But within that space, that engineering space, I was introduced to the term universal design, meaning that you can create something that basically works for everybody. So it's not a matter of creating something that works for a particular like segmented audience. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of like, inventing something that has appeal and functionality um, that everybody can use and enjoy. So an easy example would be like texting um, when it comes to cell phones or even voice command. You know, those two originated from more of an accessibility side, like someone they can't see, um, or they're blind, they'll be using their voice or mm -hmm. it's like they're deaf, they'll be using text. Well, now those are two functionalities that the whole planet uses. So we want to take like that type of concept of creating something that works for everybody and apply it to fashion. And we did it through the footwear space. No, and I think that's a really intelligent way of looking at it. And it sounds like your background really helped there too. So um, what, one of the things that I've, I've read is that universal design is not typically something that is applied to fashion. It, it is definitely more industrious and technological. And in, in the examples that you gave, you know, aviation, 
um, driving, um, phones, computers, stuff like that. But um, it's not applied to fashion. Is that because fashion is often considered like a luxury commodity or, or, or why is that, do you think? You know, I don't have a good answer to that question um, because it was basically the same question we were asking ourselves. So in that, when we made our first prototype and it worked for me and I was able to take back that independence and put my shoes on again, we, Darren and I, my fellow co-founder, we kind of looked at each other going like, well, shoot, why can't we, why can't we apply this to fashion? Because we had not seen it before. Mm -hmm. So we basically asked that same question and going like, why is this not in, why is this not in the fashionable space? And then we just kind of thought, well, shoot, maybe we're the ones to do it. I mean, I don't know if that was just more of a kicking ourselves in the own butt to like to be able to move forward or whatever to be the catalyst. But it just seemed like there was a gap out there to be able to bring something to the market that could just transcend like all different ability levels to be able to have that like element that could be enjoyment for everybody. So I don't know why it's there. I do know that in the fashion space right now, the word inclusion is thrown around quite a bit. Sure. Um, that that's a powerful word that's been around a long time, but right now it's getting a lot of limelight. And I think that word inclusive and the word universal design, I think there's areas of um, the use of synonyms in, in, in some cases, but for us, like inclusion isn't necessarily creating something that just works, like bringing this other audience that maybe, maybe wasn't picked up before. It's a matter of just work by like creating something very simple that everyone can kind of gravitate towards and enjoy. So um, I don't know. I think it makes big, good business sense to like look at it through that lens. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the industry is coming around, but I think there's a lot of pioneers out there that are working really hard to kind of penetrate that market right now. Mm -hmm. and, and something that I find really interesting with your shoes is um, this inclusion also in, in my head solves a problem that it wasn't even uh, maybe intended to solve. For example, you have kids shoes, right? And it feels like a very easy way to actually have a kid step into their shoes, zip it up, and then they can also practice tying their shoes with those shoes. And usually you got to have one or the other where it's like either the kids wearing Velcro shoes while they're practicing on a different set of shoes, how to tie them or the other way around a little bit. So what, what, what was the thought process there? Were, were you always planning on having kids shoes? Was that intentional? Was that accidental? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, great question. I mean, when we first started, we started with a Kickstarter campaign where it was two kids, it was three men's shoes and two women's shoes just to test the market. And honestly, that's as far as my pocketbook could stretch me. So that's where we had to put the cap on it. Sure. And as we launched it out there, we got feedback on all three demographics. But when it really came time to expand, we had to choose and kids seem like the most low hanging fruit because now as a parent, um, you know, I have a four year old and an 11 month old and uh, anything we can do to get those kids going faster in the morning makes all of our worlds easier. Sure. So yeah. having, having a nice easy on easy off shoe for the kiddos that they could, you know, potentially take on independence quicker. It seemed like, like a great entry point into the into into the fashion space um and uh, from there we just kind of built the business around it so it wasn't a matter of, like we just like strategize going like we're only new kids it was a matter of, like all right if we want to really try to grow this business that seems like the most logical entry point and then we can build on that momentum 100 percent. no i think that's really cool have you uh, considered other universal designs that could be applied to products uh, aside from shoes well we've got some uh, apparel ideas but, uh, you know, there's all there's so many other um, businesses out there that, you know, are, are, are really focusing 100 percent of their efforts on apparel. Mm -hmm. um, our name is Billy Footwear, so it's got to be shoe focused first. Sure. So I think uh, if, if we do bring some more like inclusive or universal design type apparel to the market, um, it's not going to it's not going to overshadow the shoes. It'll always be shoes first. But that said. There are a lot of accessories that we could bring to the table that I could, I think could complement your shopping cart when you're looking for shoes. Like for example, mm -hmm. like back to school. I mean, oh my gosh, if we had a nice accessible backpack, if we had a nice like accessible lunch yeah. tote, if you had, you know, the various, I'm really excited about the sweatshirts that have magnetic zippers where they, they clasp at the bottom to get them started. I mean, cause that works for everybody. I'm like everyone. Instead has, of having to like thread the zipper at the bottom, like you usually do. Completely. Yeah. Totally. 
Yeah. I mean, I, I remember skiing before I was in a wheelchair. Like every time you have your gloves on trying to manipulate that zipper, that was a royal pain. So anything yeah. that can make that process easier, that's something that benefit, you know, the planet. So that's the way we try to strategize and look at like um, all of our solutions where it's just more than the niche. Because niche mm-hmm. is a narrow market. Like to survive as a business, you really need to cast that net as big as possible. Mm-hmm. So it makes a lot of business sense to be able to create something that really, you know, isn't restricted to a particular audience. Yeah, and and that's kind of like the two strategies that I continue to talk with people on on this show about is some people go super niche and are probably some of the most successful that you could have in that super niche. And then there are also it, it's essentially just two different strategies where where it's like, you know completely dominate the small market or you could succeed in a wider market and have the exact same effect. And, and I think you're actually doing a little bit of both where you're, you're cornering this, you know, accessibility footwear market, but I I don't need to have any sort of disability or special needs to want to, or need to use these shoes, you know? And, and, And I think that's something that is pretty clever, at least in, in that design. So, um, I wanted to ask you b- before we kind of move on to the more particulars of the design and the business and everything, how, how you met your co-founder, Darren Donaldson. So Darren and I were on the same bus line uh, growing up, going to elementary school. We lived Amazing. about a quarter. Yeah, we lived about a quarter mile from each other. We were one grade apart. And uh, it's interesting <laughs> when you're in third and fourth grade or fourth and fifth grade or sixth and seventh grade, that one year seems massive. But then, of course, as you get older, that one year just. I mean, it just disappears. It's not even there anymore. So yeah, we grew we grew up riding the bus together, played baseball, um, went to grade school, elementary school, and high school. Even went to the same college. Um, our paths kind of separated a little bit, and then uh, we got reacquainted kind of later in life. And, and uh, the way the shoes came into the conversation, I was actually over at his house for a Christmas party, and we were catching up over a couple of beers. And uh, he was sharing with me that he was working on his own kind of independent shoe project where he just challenged himself to do something never done before. And as he's telling me this, uh, it definitely piqued my interest because at that point I had never put my shoes on. Um, there just wasn't really anything out there that I could find. Mm -hmm. So people are always putting my shoes on for me. And when he said that, I'm like, all right, Darren, I got an idea for you. And it was just a simple saying like, look, let's take a zipper. Let's put on the outside around the toe. I bet I could drop my foot in there unobstructed with my limited hand dexter. I could take that zipper in and zip it up. And uh, it was enough for him to be able to make a drawing to communicate to the factory that he was working with, uh, make a prototype. He gifted it to me. And when I put that on, it was the first time I put my shoes on in 18 years. So I broke my neck at 18. I put oh my, my shoes gosh, on at 36. Dude. And that was, that was the moment where it's like, wow, this was so incredibly special. We have to share this with the world in some way. And uh, we didn't know what that looked like, but we kind of leaned into it. And here we are. I can imagine that being a pretty, I don't know what the right word is, spiritual experience, honestly, and some sort of effect of just kind of like, you solved your problem at the end of the day, too, which I think is pretty cool, is it's not like, it'd be one thing if you found a shoe that did that, but the fact that you got to create the thing that gave you so much joy like that, I I think is, you know, pretty special. Um, Well, there was two, there were two things that happened in that moment. One was, we looked at each other going, why on earth did this take 18 years to do sure. like, Why didn't we do this like year one or year two? Like, come on. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was that real special, just, you know, you just couldn't describe it. And uh, mm-hmm. so we knew we had to do something. So then it was a matter of like creating a business to try to get the word out there and expand the brand and like just let it grow and turn into whatever it was to turn into. And uh, the more people we talked to, the more momentum it got. Just a lot of word of mouth, a lot of... Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, strategic partnerships and um, the whole mission just move forward. So how long has the company been around? It's like 12, 13 years, something like that. Is that accurate? Well, if you, so yeah. So if you count that moment of time of me putting my shoes on again independently, that was in May of 2015. And okay. then, but we hit a, another big milestone is when we hit the shelves of Nordstrom and Zappos. That was August of 2017. So there was cool. a lot of kind of development getting up to that point. And in addition to it, I mean, this, I think it's also important to understand this is a side hustle. This wasn't our main thing. I mean, we sure. were working full time. So this was working on it in like the evenings and the weekends and just letting this thing kind of build up until it became our, our thing. We were able to step away from our day jobs to be able to put all of our energy towards it. Mm-hmm. So there it is. 
So what 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 are um what's your and Darren's respective roles in the company? So we're both co-founders. Uh, mm-hmm. We're a, the the company itself is a team of twenty five, and the the executive positions. Darren is the COO, so he's in the operations side, and that would be the CEO. Okay, cool. So uh, th- that just. I, I'm always fascinated at how that works with with like two co-founders and kind of who does what role and and how that is split up. So, um, but but one thing I will say is like you know we still wear we're a very small team. Yeah. Um, so like everyone's wearing lots of different hats. So yeah, I own oh, for the sure. CEO role, but I like to I don't know that 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 title can come across kind of overbearing. I think um, in some ways. So I I do typically identify as the co-founder in this like okay you want to get technical i guess i'm the ceo because i'm the face of the brand but it's not something i'm putting out there like to try to brag about well and 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 i think that's definitely a little more team oriented is co-founder that means i'm automatically putting myself in a in a a peer status with at least one other person so i think that's cool um breaking down that design process when when you know you and darren just drew up a design, sent it to a factory. Um, Starting from kind of there on, what did that design process look like when you started working on the shoes? Well, great question because it it didn't happen immediate. So that conversation I I had with Darren, I mean, because I mean, started a shoe company, I mean, it's going to cost a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, it was a matter of like, all right, do we really have something that we can really grow this thing responsibly? So that conversation I had about that idea that was actually in December of 2011. And, uh, and the time I put my shoes on was 2015. So it's like, okay, what happened during those four years? We actually did something completely different. We were working on this adaptive ski glove because I skied before I was in a chair. I wanted to ski after I was in a chair. So we made these like ski gloves that worked for me. I could hold on to my outriggers and go down the ski slopes. Mm-hmm. And from that, we did a Kickstarter campaign, which generated some revenue which then allowed us to kind of get into the prototyping process to actually build the brand. And because of the success of that Kickstarter campaign, because of um, uh, we had a goal of 7,500 and we ended up getting 30,000. Oh, we wow. got on a reality television show. Uh, it was kind of like a, like a, a little shark tank thing on the oxygen channel. And they saw the ski glove and they said, well, what else do you have? Like, well, we've got the shoe idea. And that basically turned into like, well, tell us more. And then we were able to present our prototype and their minds were blown. And then from the, from us going on that television show, that was really the catalyst to say like, all right, well, we've got to throw more money behind this, try to leverage the exposure we're going to get from that show. Mm-hmm. So we did another Kickstarter campaign to be able to like try to capitalize on that, on that, you know, exposure. But through that whole process, there was kind of a refining of design. Mm-hmm. But we really only had one shoe. It was just a, it was just like a basic sneaker, uh, made of suede, and just trying to like, you know, vet the the concept, the functionality of the zipper. So I would wear those things around all the time, and uh, but that was like the one and only pair that were out there in the market. And then kind of as we started to get more people that saw it as a viable idea, and then us building up our own confidence, that, like let's put some money behind this, like our own money, like we put a hundred thousand dollars behind it to be a male, make the first, you know, design line and uh, then start presenting to retailers. Um, you know, we just kind of continued to gain some steam and then we were able to make more designs. No, that's, that's amazing. And and one of the things with, you know, product development and that, that research and the functionality that I think is fascinating is, you don't really know how successful it is until you use it over and over and over and over and over again. You know, that I, I remember when um, I think cell phones were first developing like the flip, the flip phone, they would, they would bust after like a month or something like that. I even remember, you know, that, that new one that's, I, I don't know who makes it, but it's kind of like the, the touch screen and it flips they had to totally recall it because the touch screen was snapping after about a month of being open and closed so much. So mm. I can imagine having to do the same thing with a zipper that you're using over and over again, you know, at least twice a day for two months and how long the sneaker is actually lasting, the sole in it of itself. Did, did, um, did you learn anything from that kind of like product testing um, that was pretty insightful? Oh, most definitely. 
I mean, the thing is, like, <laughs> the funny thing about it is that as we're entering the market, you know, that we get a lot of feedback of people that have been in the industry for many, many years mm -hmm. and just through the network. And they're saying they're, they're, uh, they're giving us advice from a pedestal of like a very big business or like very seasoned, seasoned, seasoned brands. Well, I mean, we were working out of my parents' basement. So when they say like, you need to have a big market study, like a focus group and all that, it's like, well, well, we don't have the bandwidth for that, nor the capital to be able to create this thing, nor the product to be able to throw out thousands of shoes to get feedback. So our approach, being a small brand working out of a basement, was, well, this seems like a good idea. Um, this seems to be like a very middle of the road type of design based on all these other big brands that are tried and true. Mm -hmm. And we'll work this out with the community. And we'd send it out and then we would get customer feedback because they would purchase. And then they would, um, you know, very quickly say like, well, these are working well for me. Or they would say that and then they'll offer like some feedback. And from that feedback and through that, you know, just that growing customer foundation, we were able to make adjustments. So our shoes today, yes, it still has a wraparound zipper, but the actual silhouette and what that shape looks like, um, it's much different than it was originally. That's cool. And that's based on direct consumer, but that's also based on, you know, relationships with our retail partners, um, creating something that is going to identify with their customers because the thing with the wholesale business, wholesale business, they're going to buy on the front end. So it's a great cash flow influx, which allows you to be a lot of flexibility to do more on the back end for the next season. Whereas direct to consumer, the margin is better, but it's a slower burn because you're doing it one at a time. And you, that, that cash isn't like the, the, the larger amounts of cash aren't happening on day one. It just, mm -hmm. You can make more money, but it's, as I say, it's a slower burn. Mm hmm. Well, I, th I think that's fascinating, honestly, and 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 I want to know, per, like, what's the what's the price comparison say since since we're talking about that of your shoes versus other similar products? Is is there another similar product, or, or can, are we going to have to just compare it to shoes at large? We're gonna have to kind of well. I mean, you can look at it from two lenses. One is looking at it, shoes at large. I mean, for us to be able to be on the shelves next to Vans, next to Converse, next to Nike next to New Balance, we have to be competitive. Mm -hmm. So our price point, I mean, that's incredibly important. I mean, there's no way you can survive if you're not competitive. So our price points are competitive with those major brands. Um, we're also in Target. I mean, Target, it's a very, uh, you know, they, they drive an aggressive price point. Mm -hmm. But we also have shoes in Target. They're different shoes than you would see on other, you know, major retailers because there's just less stuff in it. I mean, there's only so much you can put in to a $25 shoe as compared to a $50 to $60 shoe. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you can't put a $50 shoe in Target because then you wouldn't be competitive. So it's a matter of like understanding like the space where the product is going and to be able to make sure that you're going to be able to at least meet or beat the price point of, uh, or at least the, um, the, the value, the, the perceived value um, of that customer mm -hmm. um, in, in, in to be competitive in that space. So there was, I mean, and then you back out of that, it's like, okay, what is the margin one can receive on the wholesale side or the direct to consumer side to be able to keep the lights on and to be able to, you know, generate enough revenue to be able to pay forward in the next season where you have a new, a new product, a new colorway or a new improvement on what you have existing. Okay. So that's kind of the balance and the dance that we play. Sure. And, and I'm, I'm fascinated that you bring up, you know, both Vans and Converse, because when I was looking at the shoes, I thought of it. Those two brands immediately. I'm a personally a big Converse fan because I, I like the general durability and I like the fact that they're at a price point where I'm okay spending, you know, about 70, 80 bucks once a year. And and that those are the shoes. I, I wear those and that's pretty much it, you know? And with your shoes that one have that kind of a high top ish style. you still have low tops like Vans does and is at that price point. It automatically says this is who their competitor is. It's putting you guys in that space instead of trying to like, I don't know, novelize or trivialize your own product, which I think is, is pretty smart is that, you know, you guys take yourselves seriously. Cause I initially was like, wow, really 75 bucks. And then I looked at the shoes a little closer and was like, Oh no, these are actually like really good looking shoes 
which is why that they can price them at this like level, which isn't even that high when you consider some people spend two hundred and fifty dollars on um, Jordans or something like that. Oh, um, absolutely. I mean, well, well first off, it's incre- it's incredible how how expensive some of those really really high end uh, shoes are, and we've actually been asked by retailers to create a very high end shoe like that men's dress shoe that comes in at two hundred fifty dollars. We're not there yet, but it's just like it's intriguing how. You have customers that are asking for a much less expensive shoe and one they're asking for a much more expensive shoe. So you kind of get both those feedback. Um, but to your point about bands and what whatnot, I mean, a lot of that, uh, the reason some of the styles look like that is because those are the brands that influenced us growing up. I mean, those yeah. are, I mean, we were all about airwalk. We were all about bands. I mean, I I mean, I wore simple shoes. I was a kind of a, a an under the radar brand that I loved. I mean. So uh, we take in all those, you know, try and treat veterans in the industry and then try to take like pick the things out of each one of the silhouettes and combine it and make one of our own. So what's your general um, marketing strategy look like? I mean, Converse has been around forever, so they practically don't even need one since they've been around since, I don't know, World War One, World War Two, or something like that. And then Vans obviously tied themselves to like skating culture. So I know that you guys have your story and your branding um, in terms of the universal design, but actual marketing wise, what's your strategy look like? Well, so when we reach out, we want we want to try to communicate an easy on, easy off shoe. And I mean, that that type of language is is used by a lot of different concepts out there. The, the one thing that makes us different, though, is that unobstructed entry. I mean, so, for example, I mean, there's lots of shoes out there that like laceless, for example. I mean, but mm-hmm. you still have to shove your foot into a shoe. Mm-hmm. There's these others where the, the heel springs back. Like you just step in and like, you know, or you like you slide your foot in, then you put your heel down and uh, the, the heel pops back. But again, you still have to shove your foot into a shoe. So our shoes, um, because you can actually drop your foot in unobstructed, that has been a game changer for many of folk, including myself. So that's on the uh, really the functional side. So while we were bringing these shoes into the market, um, we got a question early on where a customer asked, like, are, do these work with AFOs? And the Lord, AFO. And I had to go, I didn't know the answer because I didn't know what an AFO was. I had to go to Google to figure out what that was. And what an AFO is, is called ankle foot orthosis, where it's like a rigid piece of plastic that one puts on their ankle to be able to help like kind of strengthen that ankle or like maybe some sort of correction on a, like the structure of one's ankle mm-hmm. or to improve one's gait. So it, it's more of a medical external device. And then the challenge is, as soon as you have that on there, is like how the heck do you shove that into a shoe because it's a 90 degree turn. So come to find out that like those that were wearing these braces were having the same challenge I was, which was just trying to get your foot with brace into like your footwear. Because if it's at so, a 90 degree angle, you can't exactly slide it in. Completely. Yeah, completely. So all of a sudden, uh, that audience caught hold of the brand and started going, oh my gosh, this is working great for my child. Maybe it's working well for your child too. So that that we got into that lane and that lane has an incredibly strong word of mouth Um the power of word of mouth is incredible. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that particular line um, has brought a lot of attention to the brand. And that's both from the user perspective, but also the clinician's perspective as well to be able to recommend the brand to all those folks out there using braces. So because of that, because a rigid piece of plastic, I mean, that's a design consideration one needs to take into account. Because if you're, if you're just a, a foot with just skin on, like, or a sock or whatever, Mm -hmm. Um, in a shoe as compared to a rigid piece of plastic the shoe is going to behave different i mean a rigid Mm -hmm. piece of plastic against canvas i mean that's that's kind of a losing battle so because of that rigid piece of plastic and potentially some hinging hardware we've had to kind of rethink um, a number of our silhouettes to be able to reinforce particular areas which better accommodates that type of device and uh, it it increases it's like durability over time exactly exactly so like injecting more rubber into the outsole, for example, like having more of a hardy weave inside the lining. So like the like the screws and whatnot don't like penetrate it through like the side or like if someone like has like more of an aggressive heel strike or a toe strike, 
um, it can actually compromise the zipper. So it's like, okay, well, that light zipper, maybe we now pull that back a little bit to have the mm -hmm. toe more protected. So all of those design considerations go into a lot of our silhouettes. Um, but marketing wise, the way that information gets out is there's a testimony attached to each one of those customers. And these testimonies are being provided. They're not just, I like the shoes. It's like, oh my gosh, these sh I've been looking for shoes all my life. Now I'm able to wear my shoes. I'm able to put my shoes on for the first time. I'm able to empower my child to be able to do something they never been able to do before. Oh my gosh, this is so much easier. My like grandfather, you know, can't feel his feet. So these things are perfect because I can put these on him and I can know exactly his shoes, his toes are in the right spot without like just guessing to make sure that, you know, hoping like the sock is like, you know, nice and smooth. I mean, those type of testimonies come in and those testimonies just catch fire because people read those and then they start sharing their own testimonies. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of the momentum and the bow wave and just the big swirling of organic growth that this brand has had. And now we're in a position to throw ad dollars at that just sure. to accelerate it. Yeah. So, and, and, and you don't have to like generate anything really. I mean, w w when you have people who are automatically giving you their testimonials, all you have to do is put those testimonials in front of other people. So you do, it's not like you have to spend all this money on, you know, branding, copywriting, coming up with like the strategy. It's literally just let it do its job. People be affected by it and then tell other people how they were affected by it. So I think that's pretty um, elegant in its sim simplicity. Um, so your shoes are available in a variety of name brand stores, as, as we've mentioned, including Nordstrom, Target, um, Kohl's, Zappos, and, and plenty more. How did you get connected with those companies? How did, how did you reach a, a partnership with them? Cause I know that's something that other people are probably interested in their products, but there is that, um, high ceiling, you know, of, of how are they going to take me seriously? What's pitch look like that sort of stuff. So how did, how was your experience um, getting connected with them? Like, yeah, yeah, that can be a real uphill battle for sure. <laughs> yeah. So uh, initially uh, it was through our own network. So within our own network, um, when it was just Darren and myself, uh, we were just kind of we were going along and I mean, we, we just, we weren't able to get to the next step independently, just the two of us. So there was a gentleman that joined our team who really was a shoe dog. His name is Patrick Foster. He was the number three of the team. And uh, he'd been in the shoe industry all of his life as a sales rep, representing lots of different brands. But he also stocked the shelves of Nordstrom way back when. And uh, so as a, um, as he, he had influence in the shoe space, to be able to have context for and introduce us to them. So it wasn't like we got into these, like, so initially we started in Nordstrom and Zappos. It wasn't like Patrick was the one that got us in there. What he did was he was able to make an introduction, mm -hmm. which allowed us to be able to present and tell the story and tell the possibility and illustrate like the market and the gap and the solution and uh, just the overall vision of what was possible. And uh, these stores could have said no, but instead they said yes. And I, I don't think, I think maybe early on for us, it might have been, you know, looking at the, in, in, the inclusive nature of the shoes and understanding that that's an important agenda. Mm -hmm. But very quickly, they saw that our product was selling and it was selling across the board. So the bottom line, if the bottom line is positive, then there's no reason to say no. But I think the entry point may have been for us because of the like more of the vision and the the goodwill behind it. And they, that's what gave us a chance. And then we just did everything in our power to make sure that we succeeded and it worked for them, which then created more uh, reorders, which then increased volume, which then increases communication and social media, which then creates more momentum. And then other major retailers see that which makes the secondary conversations with these other partners and independents much easier. Mm -hmm. and, and I find it cool that it's kind of like, you know, uh, a company's hearing your pitch and they're seeing, okay, they're in the, they're in the positive and they're so passionate about it that it sounds like they don't want to stop. I think those are kind of the two important factors that feed into each other is that not only is it positive, but with their passion and inclusion, they want to keep it they have the gumption to keep it positive, you know, and, and not kind of sit back and say, all right, our product is perfect now. Just let it sell. 
is that you guys are kind of consistently pushing for different designs, different solutions, uh, boots. Um, I, I also have to say, I would love a pair of soccer cleats that had these because I feel like my feet get so smushed every time that they put them in a um, pair of soccer boots, you know, um, I personally would love that. So, <laughs> well, I got, so I got to stop you there because I, I love that because we do get, we have had that request. Uh, cleats are in the queue. Um, I, I don't know there when this would land, but the big, the big one, I think the big one that people are asking for would be next in the queue when we get there is the cowboy boots. We get cowboy boots quite a bit. Oh, wow. And, uh, but we, we, we have a couple of design ideas, a couple of prototypes, but we just haven't got it into the pipeline quite yet. Yeah. But to your point, fleets are in there. They're just not in the 23, 24 line quite yet. They're, they're in the 26, 20, yeah. 28. <laughs> yeah. Um, so obviously, Billy, your, your personal story is an effective part of your company's branding. I mean, it, it, it kind of is the inception of the product is, is your personal story. And, and I commend you for your, your perseverance and ability to go through adversity and turn it into a positive. I, I don't think that's always an easy thing to do. So um, I, I congratulate you for that. Um, my question is, should companies have some sort of a story, maybe not exactly like yours, but have some sort of emotional connection like that, that uh, potential clients can relate to? Or was that something that just kind of worked for you guys and can work here and there? Uh, I've, I've heard kind of conflicting things about, you know, every brand should have a story. What are your what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it's a matter of identifying the why. Like, what's the why? Like, why? Why did we do this business? Why did these shoes come into existence? And for any company out there, there has to be a why. I mean, the, the why is what drives you. Mm -hmm. I mean, if there's no why, then it's like, well, what are you doing? I mean, it's and and if if there's a strong why, you can talk about the why. That is your story, and that's what people are gonna like catch window. I mean, you can you can have a, a great product or something like that, but there's a reason that product came into existence. There's a reason you're a distributor for that particular product. There's a reason you're a retailer for that particular product. There's a reason why you're trying to develop a certain product. That driver, that why, that's that's the that's the lifeblood um, that motivates you and grind through through the challenges. I mean, that's that's the big driver. So uh, I mean my why was I couldn't put my shoes on and I wanted to do something about that. And uh, the, the initial goal was to be able to solve my initial problem. But then other people started jumping on board and uh, this thing just really started to get going. And the next goal was like, well, maybe we can build this so we can put food on my table and Darren's table and we can just do this full time. And now we have a staff of 25 where there's 25 families that are now, you know, running their household um, because they have a job here, which is. I mean, I, I can't even describe how much that warms my heart. So uh, I think it's important to have a why. Um, why. I think it's important to have a story, but I think you already have a story. It's just a matter of like understanding what your why is because that drives the mission, that drives the vision, and that drives the passion. And I think the customer sees that and identifies it and it motivates them to support you. That's great. I, I think that's really special. Um, we always end our show with, with this final question, and that's uh, essentially about how People in e-commerce and business owners, entrepreneurs are working 24-7, 365, and I find it's extremely important to have hobbies and interests that are healthy that aren't totally consuming of the e-commerce space, essentially. So to promote a healthy work-life balance and stable mental health, um, what do you do in your free time, Billy? I know I know, an 11-month 11 month old child that probably keeps you pretty busy as well on top of um, your other child. But what, what do you do in your, in your free time? Wow. Well, yeah, nowadays, I mean, that, that the answer to that question definitely varies if, depending on like the timeline of my life, but looking at that, answering that question in the now, right now, my spare time is just devoted to the kids. I mean, my loving wife, my loving kids and to be able to just very cool you know, be in that space. I mean, just to be able to like watch them develop and all of a sudden, you know, having like, so my four-year-old, I mean, all of a sudden he's making a drawing and uh, he, it's a drawing of the family. And then like all the, all the members of the family are wearing the Billy shoes 
I mean, he's able to identify that or I'm able to bring a pair of shoes home. He's able to open them up and he's able to put them on by himself and he's just loving it. Or now my daughter that uh, our smallest is a toddler size five. She's not quite there yet in terms of size, but she's already like, you know, a big pile of shoes right there. And she's playing with them just because um, I don't know, just kind of intrigued by it or having the family coming to visit me here in the warehouse and just sure. kind of run around and meet everybody and, you know, help doing the boxes. And it's like, so in my spare time, it's still very much shoe related. And like, they're very much focused. Cause I mean, we're all in as a family, we're all in on this endeavor, but to be able to have that one-on-one -on -one time with the family and to be able to make that connection and try to make them better than, um, like we are as parents we want our kids to be better than we are as parents so mm -hmm. just like invest that time that's that's what i do with my spare time that's amazing well billy I, we appreciate having you on the show um good luck in your future endeavors call me when you make some cleats maybe i'll get some shoes anyway but they don't have to be cleats so um sincerely appreciate your time and your your authenticity and um until next time my friend all right thank you so much for the opportunity